that's not very pro. I'm going to switch to right hand. There we go. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's going on offline 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 okay what's going on now there we go we're live nelson mcclintock hello carol hello a hello good to see it's working the restream suite that we use to pump this out to facebook and youtube and everything else is not showing everybody is online except Everyone's in the chat room, so we're good. Jeff Edwards, hello. Big, nasty Mike Nastassi, hello. Dennis Federer, we got a, just a, I can't tell how many people are on because the software's a little bit goofy, but that should not matter. I'm going to try going with, um, without the headphones that make my big, bald Charlie Brown noggin look more big, more bald, and more Charlie Brown, so we'll see how that goes. But in the chat room, you guys, if you hear problems with the sound, please let me know. First of all... Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. I have my Friday beverage ready to go. It's been a fun week, a long week. A lot of great work got done this week. Um, a lot of stuff that I think you guys are really going to like. Finished up a Predator story. We're excited about that. We're doing all kinds of things, but we're not We're not here to talk, talk about me. Well, we're always talking about me. That's who I am. My guest this week is Gail Carriger. She has her new book, Ambush or a Door, which you can see the cover of right down at the bottom of your screen. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to be talking about, of course, Underworld. And, of course, I pimp a guest book. I pimp a Scott book. And the Scott book I'm pimping, you know, if we're going to be covering a movie about an underworld location full of monsters, the book I have to pimp is my book about an underworld location full of monsters. That, of course, is Nocturnal which has uh, quite a bit in common with Underworld. So if you are watching this and you have never read my book, Nocturnal, you should check that out. As far as the sales pitch for Ambush or Adore, we're going to get to that right now. Boom, boom. Let me get that out here. Oh, let me get Gail off mute and let me read her bio and I'll bring all of you guys up to speed. Gail Carriger writes comedies of manners mixed with steampunk and urban fantasy. Her books include The Parasol Protectorate, Custard Protocol, Tinkered Stars, and San Andreas Shifter series for adults and The Finishing School for young adults. Also nonfiction, The Heroine's Journey for writers, readers, and fans of pop culture. She is published in many languages, has over a million books in print. That's awesome. Over a dozen and many... Oh, um, over a dozen New York Times and USA bestsellers, has starred reviews in Publishers Weekly, Booklist, Kirkus, and Romantic Times. Her debut novel, Solace, made Audible's best list, was a Publishers Weekly best book, an indie bound notable, and a Locus recommended read. She has received the ALA's Alex Award, the Pricks Julia Verlager. I should have read these beforehand. These are complicated award names. The Elbacken <laughs> Award, the Steampunk Chronicles Reader Choice Award, and a Star Burner Award. She was once an archaeologist and is fond of shoes, cephalopods, and tea. I've been lucky enough to have tea with Gail Carriger. Now I bring her on. Hello, Gail. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I was just trying to think how long we've known each other. It seems like a very long time. <laughs> it's, it's a very long time, but it's it's been, you know, in little snippets here and there. Like little a, sporadic visits. Yeah. Yes. T yeah. Tea in San Francisco, lunch San Francisco, various cons, hang out with the writers yeah. groups at the various cons. But everybody watching this, Gail is one of my favorite people, fascinating in so many awesome ways. And Aww. I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to all of this. Before, yeah, uh, that's so sweet. And and how are you these days? Are you handling the the decline of the COVID? Hopefully, um, fine. You know, like like many introverts, I was not particularly shaken. At least initially, uh, you know, it was a little rough there for a while. But you know, it's yeah. one thing to be indoors and the one thing to be forced to be indoors. But uh, but basically, not a whole lot in my life changed all that much in terms of writing yeah. and professional I've been joking with uh joking with a real girl who runs all of this stuff with me that this is the best pandemic I've ever been in it's awesome I've gotten so much work done so hopefully that's been the same for you <laughs> all right up on the screen now you guys can see the cover of ambush or adore Gail's latest book Gail tell us about this book uh well this one's a little bit of a departure for me so it was a lockdown project and i got pretty introspective i think because of that so 
um, this is this is kind of one of my more romantic pieces, and uh, but I really wanted to like kind of take the romance industry to task a tiny bit about um, ageism. Okay. So uh, it's it's essentially a mature romance. It follows a couple from when they are kids, when they first meet, all the way up until they finally get together, but they don't actually get together until they're in their sixties. Okay. So um, I kind of wanted to write something a little different and it's in my it's still steampunk the main character is a spy one of the reasons she uh chooses to stay apart from her love interest is because she wants to keep working as a spy and this is victorian england so once she got married she'd have to change her lifestyle so and, she doesn't want to and the ageism <laughs> in the romance books being they're mostly aimed at late teens early 20s kind of a thing and you want to explore something different yeah yeah i wanted to give pro Pro, you know, older protagonists a chance at love too. <laughs> so, as an older, was, as an older that. protagonist yeah. myself, who has found love later in life, I can totally get behind all of that. Uh, I'm sure, that is a <laughs> fantastic book. And before before we dive into uh, Underworld, let's oops, get my guest up here. Also, tell us quickly about Solace. This is the book that uh, your, ah, your debut one. book that launched yeah. you and kicked off your career that you have been kicking ass at ever since. Tell people about this. Yes. Real quick. So Solace features vampires, so it kind of ties in with today's discussion, and also werewolves, again, today's discussion. Two okay. of my favorite character uh, character groups, uh, monster groups, monster classes, uh, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I basically uh, was reading and enjoying the urban fantasy phase, and uh, I just wanted something different to happen out of it. I was like, I want it to be historical, and I want it to be funny, and blah, 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 blah. And then I waited for someone else to write it. Nobody else wrote it, so I did. So I basically wrote a funny historical comedy of manners with vampires and werewolves in yes. Victorian London um, and not quite fitting in to Victorian London and or do they? The finishing um, school series is that that's the, the kickoff to this, right? It's a prequel series. Prequel this series. One. Okay. So the young adult series, it comes earlier on in time and is way more steampunky. Uh, it takes place in a dirigible for school educational institution for young ladies of quality, but they're actually all being taught how to be spies and assassins. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it deals with the technological revolution, which is something that's always interested me. Like why uh, humans would intentionally abandon a, a certain technology part of my archaeological background was in uh, yes. studying that kind of thing. So. And uh, now let's talk about Underworld. And for, yes. the first question is, we have to talk about this vinyl-clad vampire. You could have picked yes. any monster in the world. Why did you pick Celine? Uh, I, well, um, I was thinking about this seriously. I, so I rewatched it in preparation for this. I've, I own it and have watched it many times, mm -hmm. uh, which should tell you how much I like it. Uh, first of all, I think Celine came into my life when I was the right age for Celine, <laughs> shall we okay. say. Um, so this is the 90s, mid 90s. Um, and I remember uh, I did not cosplay her, but my friend did for Bacon back in the day. Wow. And I, there's just that there's just something so 90s appealing about her form of vampire this like just what seems very kind of like archetype ar ar archetypal of of the time period like the cw at the time period and yes. buffy and all that sort of a thing this just a badass female main character who's a warrior character mm -hmm. if you saw her on the cover of a fantasy book she would have tramp stamp <laughs> um but <laughs> like um just i don't know there's just something very campy about her mm -hmm. which i really really love at the time i took her very seriously now i see her extremely nostalgically uh but i just kind of like that she represents what essentially would become a sort of iconic main character for urban fantasy in general yeah. like this warrior female main character um in, in her case the a vampire there are plenty that are you know werewolves or humans or what have, hunters do you, think, do you think celine was a product of the urban fantasy at the time or was she more of like when this came out that skewed urban fantasy towards the celine archetype um i don't know that's a really difficult question but i i think she was more a product i would guess she's more a product of the time i think that she is representing uh sort of the culm the peak culmination of a trend in a way rather than starting a trend herself okay okay and this is interesting now you you 
remember this as mid nineties. This movie came out in 2003. Did you guys have, were you guys on source material before that? Or was that just the movie when the movie came out, that was your jam? Uh, yeah, I thought it was earlier than this. So, uh, I'm conflating two. That's all right. I got a little blurb on it. Uh, Underworld is a 2003 action horror film directed. That's right. No, 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 you're right. It's 2003 because, uh, she's 30 when she did it. Um, uh, yeah. So I just, so slightly later on in my life, then it's definitely capitalizing on the peak of a trend because urban fantasy was like the urban fantasy bubble was hot Hot. by then. In fact, it might've been, have started to die down, die down (laughs) by then. I had been Um, asked by my agent, can you write some urban fantasy? I'm like, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's going to work out for the kind of stuff I write, but um, (laughs) it was, it was very, very big at the time. So it was a 2003 movie written by Danny McBride based on a story by Kevin Javreau, Weissman and McBride. Uh, Gervo, Grivo, Grivia. Oh, I, I should have read this too. Kevin, G R E V I O U X, Grivo was wrote the original screenplay. The film centers around on the secret history of vampires and lichens, an abbreviated form of lycanthropes, which means werewolf. So they fight. These two tribes are fighting. There's a lot of blood. What? Tell us about the conflict in this movie. And could we be clear that like the script is not good? Uh, I, I, again, as we're watching it, I was like, oh, this is, the dialogue is pretty stilted. It is, it is like elevated CW. I mean, we're not, but like, you're talking to someone who, who freaking loves like, uh, Teen Wolf and stuff like that. Like, I love him. So, uh, that's not a problem for me, but rewatching it, I was like, as a writer, mm, yeah, not great. Um, not, so the, the story, the story, there isn't like, there isn't a ton of story, uh, or there is, but it's like very predictable <laughs> like it's not it's not particularly unique but right. essentially Sel- Selene is a is a death dealer which basically means she's been hunting werewolves her whole life and she's a vampire she's been alive for a very long time um because she has this tragic backstory where the werewolves killed her whole family and uh so and then she was made and the vampire saved her she was made into a vampire and then she became a death dealing vampire however uh this war that's been going on with the werewolves has kind of died down and the belief amongst the vampires is that the werewolves are sort of dead now or the lichen throws the lichens and they're not really like a threat anymore. Uh, but there's still Celine and a few, a cadre of vampires in the coven who are still hunting them down. Okay. And dur- during that process, they discover that the werewolves are after a human for some reason. And this human seems to be a key to something. And then uh, events conspire from there. Uh, and-, and the human is also the love interest and that human love interest is uh scott speedman and he was he, a star from felicity at the time which i watched every episode of felicity my ex wife <laughs> was a big felicity fan so i watched every single episode it was delightful to see him uh and in in and it's really just werewolves versus vampires it's kind of a romeo and juliet film actually the two tribes sure. Yeah. Yeah. originally the the like de- it turns out the defining backstory of the whole war with the two vampires is that um the the ruler of the lichens the werewolves um fell in love with the vampire woman and then uh but it was a, de- a romeo and juliet thing um and then the, the vampires killed her they killed one of their own in order to stop her from marrying a werewolf but also to stop her from giving birth to a a combination a a child that would be a combination of both vampires and werewolves which is what this whole thing turns out to be about it turns out to be about preventing a merging of the species the the fanged capulets and the uh, harry montagues if you will uh this This movie did amazing well. It was a budget of 22 million, which in 2003 is a big chunk of change. Box office 97 million. And the franchise across five movies, 538 million to date. I'm sure that Miss Beckinsale has a big piece of that after movies two or at least three, four, and five, which wound up making the most money. Well, she stopped. After a certain amount of time, didn't she? She stopped appearing in them. That 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 was confused looking that up. Now in the later movies, they get other people to play her. But uh, yeah, yeah, she came back and stepped away from it. I mean, there's a whole like background stuff, which I don't 
know that much about, but I think she was like dating or married to the director or one of the producers or something like that. And like, you know, there's a whole mess that goes on as well, but she was in, you know, she was in a few of them, but my, my love is really just for the first one. I don't particularly care for the lore of the, I don't find the world building like highly engaging or anything. So like, I'm not, I'm not, I just like this first movie. I've seen the second one and I remember very little about it. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, I think the first one holds up as a, as a lovely, campy, violent, blood-soaked movie fest. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, fun. the action is clean and good and well shot. I really like the um, costuming. I love yes. that. And this is, I think this is why I think of it as 90s. I think the the costuming is very late 90s like the dresses that they're wearing or everything like okay it's 2003 but <laughs> clearly wardrobe department was a little stuck in earlier trends uh, but i love that i love her fetishy you know wear outfit badass outfit and stuff like that right. so i like i'm really into the style of this movie as well as everything else and i think it's the style of this movie that probably has had the most influence i feel like um you know, like uh, shadow hunters and all that sort of stuff that that right. came afterwards, and we still have now these these campy urban fantasy ass kicking uh, series on television owe a lot of their aesthetic to this movie, or at least this kind of movie. Um, and so, for me, that's also a huge part of the appeal. Now, uh, those of you who don't follow Gail on Instagram should follow Gail on Instagram. Uh, Gail has a <laughs> fabulous sense of style which parlays into her writing and and the fashion and the clothing choices are all sort of part of the gestalt of the books and the marketing and and the cult of personality that is gail but gail i should i should have known this was coming people in the chat room are asking about your outfit can you tell us anything about these pieces yes (laughs) yes right now (laughs) Uh, let's see i have a turban on because i'm too lazy to do my hair these days i have these are vintage glasses that i had my lenses put into uh, you see fuzzy little wrap coat thingy That's from, so cool. from, from Amazon. And then I have this sweater on, which I'm deeply proud of because it looks kind of like tentacles or something. Yeah. Like I, I'm obsessed with <laughs> Octopi for those who don't know. Um, so it has this kind of, but they're like sparkly. So it's like sparkly monster. Tent- I don't know. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm wearing. I think they've got this from Poshmark or something, you know, it's, I- uh, I will have to reach out to you uh, after this because uh, I'm in a metal band now and I'm trying to trying to find the style of the singer with the metal band and I think I should consult with uh, Gail Carriger on how to. I will hear. I, I'm here to be your style. Uh, <laughs> uh, these things are serious. Uh, at least I I take them seriously. That, no, you do you take it very seriously, and it's uh, it's one of my favorite favorite Instagram feeds to follow because you're always like, oh that that is just awesome. So very good at that style of art. <laughs> Now, so this show is about monsters, and Celine, a two-part question. First of all, is she scary at all in this movie? Is she? Is there anything Celine does that is frightening to you as a movie viewer? No, and that's why I like her so much. I don't like to be scared. So you invited me onto this thing, and I was like, I don't do horror, and I don't like to be scared. It is not a sensation I, I appreciate. Right. Um, so like with very few exceptions, there's not a lot of like monster movies open to me. <laughs> um, I do like, I should say comedic dark uh, horror, like what we do in the shadows or okay. um, Fido or- Shaun of uh, the Dead, something like that. Yeah, or long Shaun of the Dead, but also long pull Black Sheep for anybody out there. If you haven't seen Black Sheep, Love hunt it. down Black Sheep, it's great. <laughs> it's so um, It's great. But, uh, but so that's the kind of horror I like what I love, but, but this to me doesn't feel, even though she's monsters and it's monstrous, it doesn't feel like a horror movie in any way to me. It's more like urban fantasy noir or something okay. like that. Okay. Um, and that's kind of why I, that's one of the reasons I like it so much. Um, so, so no, I don't find her, uh, monstrous. I find her like, just like deeply appealing. I think she's very much my kind of style of character. I really like her as a character. So let's get into your uh, your purview of being a creator, being a writer, and our, our, the monster is the hero in this entire series, particularly in the first movie. And of course, yeah. Blade comes to mind, other movies come to mind. As a creator yourself, what are your thoughts on what the movie makers did by let's take a vampire, one of the scariest creatures of all time in human culture, and let's turn that into the protagonist, make her sympathetic, and make you root for the vampire. What was your what was your take on that back then? 
if you can remember, and what is your take now as a creator of so many books and so much success in the field? Well, I think it's interesting. Okay, so um, I have theories which are entirely unproven and wildly speculative, uh, but isn't that the fun part of theories? Yes. <laughs> um, which has to do with like what um, a zeitgeist or a culture fears in uh, in this cornucopia of monstrosity is actually what's really interesting about the social structure at the time. So um, it has been a while since we actually feared vampires. Okay. I think like vampires have not really been the big baddies for a long time in American culture, at least. Instead, we've had this like werewolves for a little while, but zombies have been a big one. Yep. And I think that has to do with the idea that the vampire represents a specific kind of monster. And that monster in real world is the aristocrat, the solo hunter, um, the like masculine ultimate power. I'm thinking about kind of Dracula and the original. Um, and that's the aristocracy. So in a way, the, that, the fear of the aristocracy is what the vampire represents or the warlord and americans don't fear that we covet that that is desirable right okay. <laughs> that is the american dream to be the what is the modern aristocracy the business tycoon or what or the right. you know um the the ultra wealthy silicon valley like that's like that's a vampire now um and so we don't find it fearsome we should <laughs> but we kind of don't. Instead, it's, it's, the, the modern American fear is this sort of zombiness, this collectivism, this communal thought pattern, right. this, shall we call it, like Borgian and or communist ideology that like of, of mass, uncontrolled masses is more terrifying right now. Uh, um, or the, the way from an American perspective. The way you're describing it, it's almost like the vampire is equivalent to uh, the mob boss in gangster movies, which this, sure. is, a, yeah, this is a lawbreaker, this is and a person think, who abuses people and kills people, but he's celebrated constantly. Yeah, and we see it in um, this movie, actually. Craven, the the coven leader, who is kind of act, the actual enemy of Celine's, um, is kind of like a bad boss. <laughs> he's like a Weasley, terrible yep. middleman boss who's like making the wrong de decisions and betraying the vampires and betraying the coven, as it turns out. Um, and that, and yeah, and that's like it's very interesting under the like mafia concept. He's the betrayer of the mafia, which happens yes. in in mafia novels all the time. Um, so yeah, anyway, so that, that's kind of the broad theory. And so like, I'm kind of a spinning your question in a way um, because I don't think she actually is the the monstrosity she's actually like the admirable like she's it was it was sort yeah. of natural that americans would produce a character who was the admirable vampire like mm -hmm. you know the warrior vampire and i'm thinking of like blade and other other examples we have of this yeah yeah uh, and and like blade and her the protagonist main character sympathetic character does not come from money. They are almost always poor who have either been helped up or dug themselves up in their own bootstraps. And even yes. if they're a vampire, you don't get a lot of fifth generation mega wealth as a vampire sympathetic character because that's that's sort of the push and pull. The vampires are the aristocracy, they're the technocracy, they're the very rich. And yet at the same time, we're rooting for these vampires that were orphans or were poor or had you yeah. know, mixed marriage that's kind of thing like that. The scrappy vampires <laughs> who are breaking themselves up in the world. Uh, but that's also the like the dialogue of the movie <laughs> to dignify it, um, which is that the the werewolves represent this sort of pack mentality, collectivism, peasantry. Mm -hmm. Like it turns out, we learned that they were they were kept as slaves by the aristocracy, by the vampires, yeah. um, but also protectors of the vampires. And this whole war is in a way a class war as well. Yeah. Um, and so. Celine, who also, as you point out, like comes from a poorer background, is a farmer's daughter or what have you, um, is that her loyalties then get tested and torn because she learns more and more about the sort of complicated history of the vampires and that she has allied herself with them because she's one of them, but also she she's fought for them. Perhaps she has been on the wrong side the whole time. Um, yeah. And one of the things I like about her character is that she 
can learn and accept that about her about herself like she doesn't you know um she isn't loyal without reason um her her when her loyalty is tested she is capable of like stepping back and examining that loyalty yeah and that that's a wonderful part of this movie and wonder it's fascinating point you brought up that vampires are the aristocracy and and werewolves are you know the working class the downtrodden People have to band together to rise up against all of this. I do have one interesting question in the chat room. You don't like scary movies, but have you seen 30 Days of Night? Uh, no. Okay. Oh, maybe? Mm, I don't remember. If you don't like scary <laughs> movies, that that is a, that is a more much more savage approach to the vampire. Um, mm, mm. I have seen quite a few, like, campy vampire, you know, like, What's the one set in Santa Cruz? Um, oh, uh, the, San but, the Santa Clarita Diet? No, not that one. Um, no, the one with the boys. The one with the 80s. Oh, the 80s Lost one Boys. With saxophone Lost player. Boys. With Lost Boys. Yes. Lost Boys. <laughs> like, I've seen stuff like that, which technically is a scary movie, but, like, not anymore. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, dude, the Lost Boys is unassailable, in my opinion, as uh, all of the mistakes were completely intentional. Everything was baked in. It was planned from square one. So real, real quick, we'll jump from Underworld over to Interview the Vampire, which I'm guessing you've seen. Yes, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. But that's all aristocracy in the same thing. Yes. And, and they're not, they're not scary. It's just this concept of this all powerful ruling class which if you are not part of that all-powerful ruling class, you are helpless. It's just a matter of if they want to come get you and when they come, want to come get you. Is that kind of what you're saying with the aristocracy? Yeah, and I feel like the Dracula movies that we've seen over the years have also played onto that, right? Like this idea that um, that that is somewhat touched on in Underworld, but not as much as it is in some other vampire movies. The, the, the idea of the eternal is that the vampire has sort of become disassociated from the world. And it's not so much that he's dangerous, it's just that he doesn't really care about us. And right. he's so powerful that that's what makes him dangerous. And of course, that's also what's wrong with the ultra rich, right? It's, just, it's the lack of caring is where the biggest yeah. issue is. Um, and so, you know, and, and I'm thinking about the, the you know, mm, questionable Dracula movie with Winona Ryder in it. Uh, but like th that almost has a weirdly sympathetic gaze towards the vampire at times because the vampire is kind of lost. And, and, and again, not scary, really. Um, just kind of um, a confused threat. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, it's this has been super fun for me because it's a whole different way to think about you know the 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 class battles and uh, and and it's it's just that the vampires, by and large, being part of the aristocracy, etc., look at humanity and the rank and file in the working class. They are prey. They are cattle. Yeah. And we see that a lot. You know, like we're not going to get political, but. The way uh, Jeff Bezos is treating his employees and, and things where you get these are the werewolf, vampire, vampire is actually sort of a parallel to things we've seen many times with the lumber barons and the oil barons and people in the factories and child labor and all these other things that the people who are very rich. They, re they care about money. They don't care about the individual people working below them. And that's a very good parallel for the vampires. And I think about some of the historic vampires that we have, like Elizabeth Bathory, who isn't really vampiric, but you know the 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 bloody countess, yep. um, who you know supposedly bathed and but again, it's this idea of of it being so rich or so much in the castle above that you lose touch with the reality of the world, um, and the monstrosity comes from uh, you know you're just profound lack of interest and or caring yeah. um, even in regards to the fact that this is your food source <laughs> but you know you could i could see on a, a you know a fun modern vampire take on this where you know humans are it almost in a way you could think of the way the aliens in the matrix are where humans are just like because we are essentially just the food source for vampires we could be treated the way you know sure. industrial production treats chickens or something you know like that'd be pretty freaky and scary, but that's the way a vampire thought process always seems to work in these kinds of movies to me. All right. Now, uh, we got to get to the part of the movie of which you are an expert. Let's talk about the costuming a little bit more. Talk about oh, costuming more. So good. Gail, uh, what's the deal oh, with the vinyl? I don't know. It's the most <laughs> impractical thing to wear. Like, 
it rips really easily. It's too hot. <laughs> I did have a moment where I was like, maybe she's just so cold because she's kind of dead. <laughs> Um, has to wear vinyl. Uh, it's it, like, it's just, it shows all the dust all the time. Like it shows every speck of dust. Like vinyl is a, but boy, does it look good. <laughs> and those boots are awesome. The boots, the boots are killer. Boots in your, in your, in your expansive repertoire of amazing outfits, is vinyl a part of all of these? Or, you, you know, is it like, you're like, I'm not, oh, there we go right there. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, in honor of this thing, uh, you can't see them, but I, they're very nice. Um, I should are, have known. These are fleece lined. They're quite warm, actually. That's why I'm, and they're waterproof. Uh, so maybe that's why she's wearing. Maybe vampires don't like water. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a terribly impractical thing uh, uh, to to wear if you're going to go out fighting things. Uh, uh, I, I genuinely yeah. wonder how many she had. For oh, that, she had to go through my regular shooting. on the regular. <laughs> So the That's chat room fun. is loving the boots, and also I am upstairs, and my wife Ergil is downstairs, and there's like a seven second, ten second delay in the stream, and as soon as you put up the boots, you could hear the laughter coming from downstairs. Just uh, <laughs> your your costume has delighted the audience, delighted the <laughs> audience this evening. I'm here to provide satisfaction. Um, yeah, I love I I love her costume, but uh, but I genuinely like uh, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> How many of you in the chat have, or, or who are watching or listening, have, have recently watched this movie? But uh, Amelia, who is a minor character, has no lines. Who is the ancient vampire queen who is coming to for the changeover of the yeah. power of the covens? Okay, uh, she wears a dress, and that dress is my favorite dress ever put on screen. Uh, I want to own that dress so badly. Uh, if for any reason I'm ever walking a red carpet or going to a major award show, I'm going to have that dress on. You all mark my words. Love I it. love that dress so much. So, yeah, uh, for me, Underworld wins uh, almost entirely on the strength of that one gown. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, you can almost watch it with the volume off, the whole movie, because the, you know, oh, the, yeah. the plot and and the characters, are, or the, the actors are working their asses off, clearly, but there's only so much they can do with what they're given. But you could turn the volume off, put on some goth music, and just watch. It's beautiful. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it is. It's almost like a music video. Like, you could totally see, like, Vast or something cutting this, and it would just be an extended music video. Um, it's it's kind of visually like that. But but could we talk about Michael Sheehan and Bill Nighy? Like, yep. two of the UK's greatest actors just chewing the goddamn scenery in this movie like they are wood chippers <laughs> they're just like <laughs> boys what like you're cashing that paycheck but i love watching those two so much uh so bill nighy plays the uh coven leader who victor who's awakened uh who turns out to be the big bad yep um like and michael Sheen plays the um plays the leader of the Lycans, Lucian. And uh, and I just think they're both great. They, <laughs> just, they, they showed up, they got out the shovels and they went to work. Totally went oh to work. Oh boy, did they. Yeah, and like you said, you can almost watch this whole thing on mute and follow exactly what's happening because <laughs> their faces are just so expressive. So and, and it is such a essentially like predictable, basic plot oh, yeah. structure that yeah. you're just like, oh, I kind of, oh, of course, like, Lucian has a sad backstory. Like, of course, you know. Now, the the last bit we'll ask on is you as a high-level professional storyteller, as as a, a novelist, we have a lot more room to set things up to get to the betrayal. And I forgot to check the runtime of this, but it's probably like 90, maybe 95 yeah, it's minutes. Pretty it's pretty I tight. think, yeah, it doesn't push any boundaries. When, when you watch this movie, and you're right, it's completely predictable, you see everything coming the whole way through. D at this level of your career, does that detract from your enjoyment? Or are you sort of able to regress? Because not just this movie, but other movies that come out now. You know, this you've been at yeah. this for a long time. Now you're a very seasoned storytelling professional. I have trouble watching movies now and be like, when I know everything is coming, it's hard for me. How is it for you? Uh, well, I uh, this is a really interesting question because I will lose my mind and talk extensively about series or television shows or whatever, where I could not predict what was going to happen, where the ending like knocked it out. And I'm obsessed with endings. Endings have to be good. Um, and the ending like knocked it out of the park and you were like, I didn't see it coming, but it's still the perfect ending. Okay. 
Um, and the example I always use, which is an old example, but is the USA Today La Femme Nikita series. Oh, I which love, had, love that. Which is a brilliant series. Again, stylish. Oh, my God. Um, oh. It had a five, season, a five season run and then a baby six season where they got to wrap everything up. Mm -hmm. And I thought that ended beautifully. I had no idea how it was going to end and the way they ended it, the twist in that ending, which I'm absolutely not going to give away because it's too good, yep. um, was so unpredictable. And I was, I was just so delighted with that, even though I personally always like a happy ending in, in this particular case, I was like, no, that's the right ending, the right ending one for that show. Um, so when that happens, I get very excited about it, but, uh, but that happens as a writer, more and more, more and more rarely because, you know, and you know this, Scott, like as writers, one of the things we want to do with our readers is take them by the hand and be like, you might know, not know what's going to happen, but also I'm going to drop a few clues. So if you're mm -hmm. super smart, you might pick up on a foreshadow here or a foreshadow there. So you might know what's going to happen, but also like there'll be some surprises along the way because you want readers and watchers to feel smart. So yes. especially if you're writing something like a mystery or crime, you want them to discover the answer just like a split second before your um, Sherlock announces what the answer is, right? Yep. Because that makes the reader feel both satisfied, but also smart, right? Or, or if, um, they, and, if they didn't get it, they go back and look like, oh, she showed me that all the way through. I just missed it. Yes. And that's a delightful experience too as a reader. Exactly. But you don't, but you don't want your readers to feel betrayed like, like the, the ending came out of nowhere or the answer came out of nowhere. Cause that, cause that's unsatisfying for the reader. You get right. this, the, the, that will break the immersive experience for them. So, so like back to your question, uh, with cinema, it kind of, for me, uh, really depends on what the genre is and what I, what I like go in with my expectations of. Right. So, you know, like if I'm going in to watch a romance, I expect the main couple to get together at the end of that. Sure. And, and I expect certain tropes to be dropped. You know, I expect a kiss. I expect a wedding or a sex scene. I expect these things, whether it's a book or a movie or a series or what have you. Um, and I will be unsatisfied if those tropes and archetypes are not hit, if those expectations are not met. Okay. Um, but with other cinema with like sort of experimental stuff or something that's pushing the boundaries, then I'll go in and I'll just, and, and I'll be, I'll be okay if it's a little predictable, but I'll be definitely be more impressed if it managed to both satisfy me as a consumer, but also be a little unpredictable. Yes. So it kind of really depends. Uh, I will say we have bonded yet again. Uh, Peter Wilson in the USA, La Femme Nikita. Uh -huh one of the best action stars ever uh, just the, her ability to in in for for action stars to be able to sell action and you like you wince from a punch that that takes a lot of work but for her to show up and like being like six two and show up in four inch heels with a red vinyl dress and then just whoop someone's ass and you believe it every minute of it she was fantastic so that was a, also a she wonderful was show. built like one oh, of the just, like lucy lawless like yep. one of the things i loved about her was that she looked like you she could kick you know she used to be a pro volleyball player yep or semi pro so like you can tell like girl could in fact kick your ass <laughs> It was, it was a, a wonderful show. And so um, I will ask you one more question because this is rolling. Uh, the, the show that I am enamored with now, and I hope it comes back soon because I have no effing idea what's going to happen because it's all a bunch of bullshit, but I'm okay with it, is <laughs> Claws. Have you seen Claws? Mm -mm. Claws no. is a movie about a, uh, a, a group of women who run a nail salon. Oh, get, I heard about it. Uh, yes, 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 yes. They get into the... Uh, Nishi, uh, forgetting her, the actress's name. Hey, put that in the chat room if you can. Nishi Nash, I think. But it's just all crazy fashion, all crazy nails, and just it's a it's an old school soap opera. So things happen like I didn't see that coming because no one could have seen that coming ever because they just tried to find the most bizarre angle they could. Are you in anything like that? Just the coming out uh, of well, I, I was going to say, I could counter. Uh, this girl went on a Korean drama slash Thai drama deep dive during uh, okay. during the last couple of years. Um, so uh, I, I should say that I was minimally into Thai dramas in particular for a while before that. Uh, one uh, very different of mine is Thai. And, you know, I've been 
attempting to teach myself the language. And so part of that was like getting into Thai dramas. Plus they're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's that's a different thing. What I did fall in love with and keep recommending because it is entirely my Ballywick is The Uncanny Counter. If you guys haven't seen that, it is on Netflix. Um, it is basically a, it's, it's again, it's a lot of like classic tropes that I really enjoy. So it's a, uh, student with, a uh, with, um, an, an old injury that makes him like physically limited, uh, who turns out to be, you know, like lucky special and is recruited to be one of the local demon hunters and they run their demon hunting operation out of a noodle shop. <laughs> and, um, and it's just a little like quirky, they're all grumpy and quirky found family. And they all have like angel guardians who like help them kill the demons. And um, and of course, like he has like weird extra special powers that may be bad or may okay. be good. And there's a, a, you know, a tragic backstory and like everything you could want. Uh, but it's like just super quirky and really fun. And it's beautifully well executed. And what was the name of this um, again? It's called The Uncanny Counter, the as uncanny in counting counter. or uncanny counter. Um, and it's a completed... It's supposed to get a second season, but the first season stand, holds together really well Wonderful. as one solid, completed arc. Gail, um, thank you for being on episode. the show. This was very fun. Uh, and Underworld's a great movie. If people have not seen it, should watch it. Where should people look for you? I've got your Twitter up, at Gail Carriger on the screen right now. Is that the same for Instagram? Uh, yeah, it's Gail Carriger everywhere. I'm, I'm pretty good on jumping on a platform and owning my SEO. Um, and you can <laughs> yes. find, you can search uh, Gail Carriger and then whatever you want to follow me on. Uh, but I should say that I that I mostly talk like writing stuff, especially right now because it's NaNoWriMo on Twitter. Okay. Um, Instagram is more for like, I like I use each platform kind of differently. Um, but you can find me on my website and uh, figure out where you want to follow me there if you want to follow me at all or just say hi. <laughs> Love it. Thank you for being on the show. This was delightful for me. It was awesome to see you again. Really fun. It was nice to see you too. All right. Good day, madame. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I write these scripts down. These shows are only half an hour, and yet I forgot to tell you about the upcoming guests. So those of you who are still on, upcoming next week, actor Bronson Pinchot talking about the Wicked Witch of the West. This is the episode that I screwed up a month ago. And but we he has been a very gracious human being and he's happy to come on again and give it another shot. And then the week after that, one of my favorite people, scientist Dr. Kiki Sanford, a great science communicator, the host of This Week in Science, one of the longest running podcasts in the world. And today I got her to settle on the monster she wanted and she picked one of my favorites, Brundlefly. Uh, we are going to be talking about Brundlefly and I... I, I Part of the part of the reason I love this show so much is some of my favorite people come on and they're like, what about this monster? And I'm like, holy shit, that's also one of my favorite monsters. Brundlefly is the jam. Dr. Kiki Sanford is the jam. It's going to be great. Then we may or may not be on for the day after Thanksgiving. I have a couple of tenders out for that. Of course, that's uh, family time, Halloween time. But on December 3rd, Author Mallory O'Meara, who's got her new book out called Girly Drinks, which gets into the history and the science of women's influence in the world of cocktails. Fascinating. She is just such a wonderful, delightful person, and she's going to be on with us to talk about the creature from the Black Lagoon because she has written a book about that as well. So you guys are all fantastic. Have yourself a Friday drink. I've got, out of the blue, a high school buddy coming in out of town. A and I are cooking, well, Ace cooking dinner. We're hanging out tonight. It's going to be a wonderful weekend. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. We will be back next week with Bronson Pinchot. If you've never watched him talk since the old days of his TV show, you absolutely need to turn in. Smart guy, funny guy, caring guy, lovely human being. You guys are all going to enjoy it. That is it for this week. I will sign off, and uh, if Gail Carriger is going to wear that dress on the on the red carpet, when I have a red car- carpet moment, I'm going to wear some vinyl. I'm going to do that right there.